Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Ball Poetry Podcast, where today I'm back after a long sabbatical, which we'll talk about in a second, but I'm here with the first of a few chats I had again with Andrew Whitstead, which I recorded a long ass time ago, and I'm sorry it's taken so long to get this together for you. But I needed to take some like mental health time, guys. Like I, I I've been going through some shit. I wasn't really feeling that great. Through all of that, I was also trying to come up with like a new ebook strategy, which if you um, are subscribed to my channel, you would already have seen. I posted the video for that. In fact, um, Pharma Phoenix Rises, one of my out of print chat books, is now up as an ebook on Amazon if you are interested. And if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can read it for free. So there you go. Also, this month, Poems Over Pussy, out now. And The Bloodshed Review, Issue 3, out now. Jeff Taylor, Adam Crawford, Tamara Albana. As well as The Blood Rag, Issue 15, with Stephen Bruce, Michael Lee Johnson, Garrett Carroll, Chasey Delaney, Adam Crawford, and yours, Trale. As well with Bunny Wild's Blood Rag of the Year. So that's a whole bunch of that. And then in the Bukowski Book Club this month, we are doing Dangling in the Turnforsha, is how you say that. So there's that. Next week, Blood Rag issue 16 will be out. And my new chapbook um, of horror poetry called Abnormal Brain will also be out. And also later this week, the digital version of Poems About Fucking will be out on Amazon because um, it is not out of print as of yet. I'm out of stock of it. I have 20 copies of that book left out of 60, but I haven't printed the covers for them yet because I need to set the ink and I keep forgetting to get fucking hairspray. Following week will be my other chapbook of horror poems for Halloween coming up right here called 13 Miles South of Hell. And the cover is going to be a little bit different than the chapbook version of this. And again, if you are interested in getting my chapbooks, get them while you can, because soon I'm only going to have the cha- the new chapbook each month and then one out of the anarchy vault and then at the end of the month they will switch out and there will be different ones there as far as this episode something that i've been noticing a lot more of and i'm really glad this is happening and i hope this stays true through this next election cycle but i feel like people with differing views on things are feeling more comfortable having conversations and sharing ideas, okay? For a long time, I feel like if you disagreed with me, we just can't be friends anymore. If I disagree with you, I'm assuming you're gonna block me on everything. And I feel like that's kind of waning, which is excellent for just discourse in general. Like, we need to be able to talk to people from all walks, okay? Now, this does not necessarily mean we have to agree with every view they have. And this is kind of the problem that I've been having with a lot of these people who can't just come out and say whether or not they agree with something somebody said. And they pussyfoot around and then play the victim when shit goes wrong. With all of that said, The next few conversations that I have here with Andrew, they're enjoyable because Andrew's a cool fucking dude and I like talking to him, you know, but we do have some disagreements on some things and that's fine. You're allowed to talk to people who have differing views than you. It doesn't make you a bad person. Just own your fucking views. In this episode, we talk a little bit about politics and poetry. We talk about 
Twitter mentality. Kind of the same shit that whenever me and Andrew get together, we talk about, we talk about it here. But this is just kind of like a prelude up into this um, theory that Andrew has that we will be going over um, in future episodes. But because this is episode 99, let me just get this out here because this is the one thing I wanted to say. Episode 100 is coming and I have tons of questions from you guys. I have some voice clips. I have um, email questions and I have questions from um, podcast comments. So I will be recording that episode sometime later this week. Okay. And when I say later this week, I mean in the next within the next five days, I'll probably be recording it. So if you have any questions that you want me to tackle on that episode, leave them in the comments below if you're watching this on YouTube or just send them to me at ihatematwallgmail.com. I have a bunch, I'm gonna try to get to all of them and it might be just like a really fucking long episode or an episode in parts because of all the questions, okay? So um, with that said, thank you for hanging out with me on this little journey as long as you have. You guys have been wonderful and I appreciate it. So with all that said, on with the show. Fuck, oh, dude. I've done so many fucking interviews where like I forgot to hit fucking record and then I'm like, oh, wait, we're going to have to redo all that shit. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Because now everybody can be a bully. Yeah. So like, yeah, I, I think it is like, it, it not just like the two fringes that drive the discourse, although I think that's the case for almost every topic that's discussed online, you know, politics, the most hot button one, but like, yeah, it makes the fringe, fringes come to the forefront. Why? Because now everybody has a voice, right? We've democratized yeah. that to the point, which is a good thing, I think, in a lot of ways. For sure. But then, it's, uh, you know, for example, I just like Glenn Greenwald had this great thread uh, recently. I don't know how people, I know Glenn Greenwald has uh, is controversial nowadays, but he never used to be. <laughs> he never used to be when he was getting his Pulitzer for the uh, for the for the Snowden and Julian Assange stuff. But it was like uh, he did this thing on David French. Just did a column in the Times this past week. He said paragraphs of it were dedicated to you know trolls on Twitter, basically, where like the the, the replies that he gets to his his posts on Twitter, you know. And like, it's just, how did we get here? How did we get to where the guy writing for the New York Times is so preoccupied with, you know, 100 follower, 1,000 follower accounts that are like, you know, replying in his comments, you know, on his yeah. posts or whatever. And now we're all driven towards the most basic fringe. So even if it's like 10 people, 15 people that are doing that, getting under his skin in those comments, he's now writing about it in the most prestigious paper of record, like in the world, you know, like the New York Times kind of thing. Yeah. So it's this really, it changed everything. Like I always say, it changed everything. Everybody gets to say what they think right away, yeah. real time now. Like, and 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 now we're trying to do things where like, oh, you're not allowed to do that. Certain people aren't allowed to do it. So well, hold on. We can't go that way about it. Because then it starts being like, okay, who's allowed to say what kind exactly. of thing? Well, you just have like, to let everybody I'm, do it. But... What I'm actually really curious about, because like X, okay, Ooh. Like, this whole fucking thing is so fucking stupid. But, like, I think the fact that, like, Elon Musk has totally destroyed Twitter, I wonder if that's going to have, like, like repercussions into how people communicate on social media. Because for the most part, there were a type of people who were on Twitter that weren't, like, the same type of trolly kind of people who were on Facebook. Right. And I think a lot of people have either gone off Twitter or aren't as excited about Twitter as they were fucking six months ago. And I don't know if they have found a place where they can go be assholes again or like just go run their mouth. You know? um, I haven't thought a whole lot about this, but I do have a, t a few takes on it just because I use Twitter almost daily. I do try to take mm -hmm. breaks from time to time, but, you know, I'm addicted to it. So that's hard. But it's like yeah i think there's a lot of talk about how twitter is going to end but like it's one of the most addictive apps out there like, it's not ending mm -hmm. people are addicted it's like cigarettes right like people are addicted to these like they will always have kind of a baseline sale because mm -hmm. as soon as you get addicted well now they have a customer for life kind of you know like and it, i always say it's the first thing people do in the morning is they check their social media and twitter is the smallest user base out of you know facebook instagram all these mm -hmm. other ones and people always try to use that but it's just 
it's not going anywhere. These people are still on there. You know, Taylor Lorenz is still tweeting, you know, constantly, mm -hmm. even though she's writing articles about how TikTok's the new thing. It's like, yeah, TikTok is the most popular thing with kids, but the discourse, the stuff that ends the, up in the papers, yeah, the discourse isn't it's all on Twitter. That. Yeah, it's all on Twitter. TikTok's yeah. honestly like more positive. Like it's actually kind of happy if you're scrolling TikTok or something as opposed to Twitter. Even Facebook. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't jumped. Crazy, I haven't but... jumped on TikTok yet, but like I'm inching closer. And closer towards it i just like the the whole idea of it makes me feel like oh society's ended and now i like you know like at the end of fucking um invasion of the body snatchers <laughs> when they're just kind of like fuck you know like maybe we should just like become pod people and fucking do the fucking thing <laughs> like that's where i feel like i'm at right now and i feel like donald sutherland's gonna go <laughs> at me like any second now dude oh uh, yeah but you do, but like you only need like a thousand to make something turn into a fucking like movement. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't even really need that many, but when you hit a thousand, that means that overnight, like you could be in the millions, you know, if those yeah. thousand people do what they're supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, things are so fucking weird now. Everything is so micro fucking, I don't know. It's like, like it's just like when I was saying, <clears throat> like, the mainstream's dead. Like, there, I don't think there's a fucking mainstream anymore. I think there are a million pockets of things, you know? There was a viral tweet that I always remember uh you know of course it's a viral tweet so i don't remember who said it or when or anything like that but it comes across every once in a while where it just said like everything is more niche and more popular at the same time than ever like everything is more popular than ever and also more niche than ever so you have all these like popular things like poetry for example like by number standards right it's more popular than ever but at the same time it's so fractured and niche there's all these different communities within that big popular poetry thing that's like fractured and different so you could hear about these poets in one circle and not hear about these other ones in a different you know like it's just yeah every, it's more popular than ever but also more niche it's this weird paradox that the internet and especially social media has just kind of it forced us all into we have to live yeah. through the kind of everyday paradoxes of life belief mm -hmm. you know do people actually believe what they're saying online or are they just trolling like all this kind of shit like it's just all and the ugliest parts of humanity are there for everyone to see now it's yeah. a show you know it's a fucking show it's like when you look at it in the terms of if this is something that the industry is going to be doing or whatever you know like or if they're going to take part somehow it's easier to like it when you're going full speed to turn a jet ski or to turn like a ski boat than it is to turn a yacht or to turn a cruise ship or to turn a aircraft carrier you know what i'm saying like you can oh, yeah. pivot and turn like immediately to do stuff but the big companies the the industry itself like they need to like slow down, slow down enough, slow down right. enough, and then like slowly make this big wide turn and it takes them forever to fucking do it. And it's funny when you see the industry try to do that. Like it, it's all these like slow little steps and you're just like, oh, Jesus Christ, by the time you turn around, no one's going to give a shit about this anymore. And we're going to be doing something else, dude. And they oh. don't. Yeah. That's the other thing is the trends could be manufactured and then obsolete within a 24 hour period. So you can have something that's trending for 24 hours and everybody dyes their hair a certain color, everybody, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the trend is, some solidarity thing. And then within 24 hours, nobody remembers it even happened. You know, like there's like yeah. old photos that pop up on like Facebook memories. That's like everybody's memory now. It's just like what pops up on the timeline yeah. when they log in so fucking weird like, oh yeah i remember that it's like yeah we well, yeah. didn't actually because everybody's brain is fried you know and it makes me wonder like how are like music fads going to change when things happen so quick you know what i'm saying because like whenever like there was like a scene or like a movement it lasted like fucking anywhere from like five years to a decade 
Right. You know, and it's like now it's like, how is that even just everything's fucking screwy and weird right now? But this isn't even what we were coming on here to talk about. Like, hey, I'm <laughs> always happy to talk to Matt Wall, you know. <laughs> we're having good talks dude unfortunately i don't i don't keep up with a you know if it comes across my timeline i'll see it but i do it's hard for me to follow a lot of the the literature stuff on social media man like it really is it's so cringe and it's so kind of uh you know eye roll inducing yeah every every day <clears throat> give or take sometimes some days there isn't but pretty much every day there is a controversy. I think it's everybody knows it. Everybody feels it and can see it. Like something's different. Something's Where's the different best than it place? Used to be. Where's the best place to be on top of controversy of the daily controversy? Is this Twitter? Is this Reddit? Twitter. Is this Twitter? Yeah. Okay. I, but... I would say Twitter, but uh, yeah, Twitter is the one where you're going to get it all. And it, but it does depend on who you follow. It does depend on who your proportion. Yeah. You know, are you in a bubble? Do you make an effort to not be in the bubble? Do you follow people you disagree with just to avoid the bubble? Kind of, you know, like what do you, you know, are you tailoring it to be a little echo chamber, or are you tailoring it to be get interesting conversations, which is what I like to do. Yeah, I like to get interesting, smart people from every angle. Usually, and that usually helps me to not be too captured from the echo chamber although you know you're still we all still fall victim to that you know yeah there's no avoiding it completely i feel like i have a problem with um the twitter type of have trying to have a rational conversation because i fucking i even when i type i'm cussing like a sailor and fucking talking the way i talk and i think a lot of people misread my tone and then they'll say something that might not even be that bad, but I hear it in my head the way I would hear like an ex-girlfriend fucking saying that to me. And then I'm like, whoa, whoa, motherfucker. Like, da, 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 da. and it gets like all out of hand. So I'm like, I can't even fucking get into normal discourse that way. Because I feel like so much of it is body language and facial right. expressions and the whole fucking thing. I think there's definitely the fact that we do most of our communicating through text now on social media apps definitely change things. Cause like you said, we're missing the bigger pictures. Usually tone is hard to, to, to determine through just text, especially when you're writing quickly and just firing off shit, you know, whatever body language smile, were you smiling when you said it or were you at, you know, were you the, 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 the meme, right? The Wojak meme, the fake tears behind the smiling mask, right? Like, I'm fine. You know, I'm fine. You know, people act like that, but it, it's, it has changed it, I think, to the point, and I think not in a good way. I think that's even you saw this stuff with the reason I think everything got so crazy in 2020. You know, John McWhorter said this, and I think he's right about it, where there's the fact that everybody was doing everything on Zoom. So all these blow ups were happening in like work meetings and, and you know, panel meetings and discussions because everybody was on a fucking video screen. Like nobody was in the room, you know, talking to somebody face to face. It was all through this barrier of the screen. And so mm. it felt like it wasn't as real, you know, cause it, thing with social media, right. Somebody will say, fuck you. They'd never say that to my face. Like they would never say that yeah. to my face in the middle of a conversation about something like this, but they can do it online. Dude, that is you like know, 100. But, and, but th- then that's when I'm like, Oh, so, and like, you might like scoff at this, but this is when I go like, Oh, is that my male toxicity and shit? Like in my fucking like white privilege that the second somebody <laughs> fucking says something to me in person, it's like I know for a motherfucking fact that every single person who's given me shit online would never in a million fucking years even consider saying that shit to me in person. You know, but then I'm like, oh, now I'm getting all puffy and bully like and shit right there. Right. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe I'm the fucking issue here. You know, maybe when I'm having normal conversations with people in person, people are guarded because I come off like a fucking stupid ass fucking firecracker. You know what I'm saying? So maybe this is like my karma and I should just fucking eat it and smile, you know, and you're and you're, and you're a bigger guy, too, right? You, uh, yeah, you, uh, you fill up the doorway when you walk in kind of Dude, thing. Like, I uh, fill up the fucking room when I walk in. Dude. Yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm a bigger guy myself. And uh, it's uh you know, people are afraid of you in person too. So like when I walk into a room, I'm always smiling. Like I'm always mm-hmm. smiling because people, I know they're afraid of me, just like my size, they're afraid of, and it's it's just it's like subconscious, not like they're thinking that. It's just that yeah. I make 
them nervous because of my size standing next to them, like towering yeah. over them or whatever, you know. See, and so that's I'm always the thing trying to be funny. extra nice. But then online, you can't see how big anybody is. Or so again, exactly. nobody would ever dare come up to me and say, fuck you to my <laughs> face. They'd be too afraid, you know, but like oh my they God. do it online. And I'd say, yeah, they're cowards, dude. Most like, of them. But the the funny thing is like you have a nice smile you can like and like you're well kept and everything like that you could walk into a room and smile and everyone be like oh that's a nice looking chap look at him being nice <laughs> i walk into a room smiling people think like i fucking murdered a cat and like i have it behind my back they're like what's wrong with that guy <laughs> they come in they're like whoa <laughs> like oh shit something's going yeah. on yeah i don't know like so like for a lot of social shit like i tend to really not do public shit anymore unless it's something that like i know i have to be a part of or something that i'm like needing to be there for work or something like that you know or whatever you know it's just like i don't know well, there's and this then, new like, type of it. There's a new type of bullying, right? Like there's this new type of bullying that you said, it's not the physical bullying beating up people on the playground anymore. It's this kind of um, moralistic bullying, right? Mm -hmm. Your morals are inferior to mine and therefore I'm going to bully you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's this kind of, it's a soft, like kind of cowardly way of bullying, right? Well, like, it's also it's like, the schoolyard yeah. mentality. Like everyone in yeah. this room has to agree with me before I fucking tell you that I'm going to bully the shit out of you, <laughs> you know? Cause if I'm the only one in here with that opinion, I'm going to keep my fucking mouth shut. But as long as yeah. everyone here agrees, then we could fucking go to town. Yeah. And it's difficult to say, uh, where that comes from and, and i think that's it's difficult to to pin it down too because it is just kind of like a cultural atmosphere mm -hmm. you know it's kind of like who's in charge of this well nobody's really in charge of it right it's just kind of a milieu that everybody's kind of rolling around in kind of because you know you, who controls that well technically everybody does you know yeah, an yeah, artist yeah. can come along and change the trend or something but yeah i mean it makes it harder to talk about which I think is why people go directly into the political realm where they start talking policies. I mean, with this political policy, but I'm like, I don't give a fuck what you're talking. I'm talking about poetry, motherfucker. Yeah. You want to bring up some fucking political bill that was passed in Tennessee? I don't give a fuck. I've never lived in Tennessee. Like, you're not making an argument. You're just trying to moralistically bully me into changing my tune because you don't like it. You know, like... And I just, I hate that. And in fact, my my instinct when people do that to me is to reflexively dig my heels in and not budge a fucking inch and just say, I'm not going to do anything you tell me to do, actually, because I hate you. Yeah, like, that's why. I hate you. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you, you this. stepped over the line, yeah. Okay, now, now this is going to be a political discussion for a couple minutes here. Do you think it is possible that when some state that you have nothing to do with or nothing to have anything to do with, if they pass something that other states will see, oh, that state passed something, we should pass that too. Like, and then it would be something that would affect you. Like, do you see how that could be like a. Sure. Yeah. And that's how things go, right? Like that's how yeah. everything goes. Like you see, yeah, one state doesn't, oh, you can do that. And it's the same thing for art, right? If we, when we talk about art on podcasts like this all the time somebody does something cool and then somebody copies it, you know, or yeah. in the political realm, you know, depending on which side you're on, people are like, Oh, they do something great or do something terrible. Yeah. You're going to lead to copycats and then yeah. that can be better or worse. But at the same time, this is what I mean, right? Like we, then it's like, okay, am I responsible for, you know, like, am I responsible for addressing that? Like I have no fucking power in the state legislature. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, that it's always brought up and i think it, it is kind of people use that stupid phrase like what about ism like it is uh, kind of like a yeah. what about ism in some say, well what about this it's okay what about it like you know yeah what about it like does that change my opinion on emily dickinson no uh <laughs> you know like does that change my opinion <laughs> on this one writer whose book i like no yeah. uh i think and people are searching for meaning there's a lot of that there's no meaning in anything anymore. Everything feels fake. Everything feels scripted. Everything feels like the passion is gone, particularly in a lot of arts. I feel like that's a common depressing kind of sentiment that people carry around and lament. Yeah, for real. 
And then they try to rationalize it away with, yeah, like, well, this bill was passed and that's why it's it's like, okay, dude, <laughs> this bill was passed. Well, like, yeah. let me ask you this. Do you think, because one thing that I have noticed is that the people who, like the poets who have come out of, and and you guys, you, you probably aren't going to see it like this because of like some of the jerk shop episodes I've heard, but like, it seems like the poets who are super politically active are now not the ones who went to university they're like more like just the street or online poets as and the more mfa poets who i've spoken with are more like well dude like i don't give a shit about politics i vote a certain way right. that's about all i do like things will just work themselves out like, do you see that that's a progression that is moving or? Yeah, I do. And I, I think I think you're right that it is. I think the trend, the winds are changing slowly, but surely. Mm. Uh, and I've I've noticed what you're saying, too. Like when I talk to MFA friends or other people at MFA, it's like the grumbling that used to be very quiet a couple of years ago mm. is becoming more prominent where they're like, you know, I'm really not a political writer. I never yeah. really cared about this kind of stuff. I'm just going to keep doing my thing. Uh, but then in there is an incentive right to keep doing that like when you see like the best-selling writers what are they doing well they're still doing political stuff at least poetry stuff um yeah and it's because i think because of social media it's kind of taken over everything there's this there's a political backdrop to everything on social media you know like like when you're posting something online it can be attacked but from a political angle on either side really and you see people do this in bad faith on both of these both sides i think and, yeah uh, but it, there is like an incentive to be like how political can you be you know can you use this kind of historical relativism to uh you know beat your opponent over the head with it kind of stuff yeah i i think there is a shifting wind so i think you're right that there's the, the trend over the last eight years you know it's been eight years so of course it's changing you know it's coming yeah. to a different headwinds and something's changing and there's a co couple cool writers that are doing cool shit that isn't political you know isn't political at all yeah. and we needed that i think we needed a few artists to be like hey you know you don't have to follow these rules like you can do whatever you want kind yeah. of thing and we just need to see people do that more and more i think otessa you know uh <laughs> my year of rest and relaxation um her stuff you know her stuff's never been political she's actually shied away from politics and has actually written what well, i don't think they're controversial but there was a controversial backlash to a couple of her pieces just because she doesn't play the politics games you know so she'll say something that will piss off one side and then say something that'll piss off another side if you're just doesn't do the political correctness or the political kind of rules that everybody is has been forced to follow the last eight years but yeah i, I agree with you i think there's changing it's changing like, when do you think that started because it seems like that it used to be like the college kids like in the 60s and 70s and probably even the 80s that were like trying to like push like social change and all this shit right and it seems like there was some i don't know when the fuck it happened but it's like like is it just because of the internet like people feeling like they don't need to go to school because of that or it's interesting if i had to guess and it's this is a question i you know i don't have an exact answer on but i'm curious so i always ask my guests usually this too especially if they're writers and they're, they're working in the field or you know have been working in the field for a while at least and then i'll be like okay when did you think this all started happening like the political because there was kind of a, a there was like a a bleeding kind of slow bleed into the into the culture through social media uh you know in like the kind of since social media's invention like 2007 ish to you know and then i think what really set it off what made it and then some people get upset when you say it, it was trump getting elected like uh, it was trump got elected and everything hit the fucking fan and everybody knows it like everything was different from that day forward mm -hmm. the way you people you know all of a sudden people started getting canceled for social media posts started losing jobs for social like all of a sudden that was happening and it was because this guy that you know people didn't like got elected uh it was it's going to go down in history, I think, is a huge, like, we, we're kind of too close to it to write about it in a historical perspective now, but I think it's going to be very interesting reading 
the history books 20, 30 years from now, how they well, categorize well, it, this era. Like, and it also depends yeah. on who actually comes out on top on all this. Yeah. Because yeah, like the winners true. write the history yeah. books, you know? Right. Um, but that's for sure. I'm wondering, okay, this is like now I'm just like totally speculating. Because the Bush Gore election that had a lot of the same shit that the Trump Clinton election had. Oh, but yeah. I think when 9 11 happened, like the country was just like, like, we can't believe this happened. Let's all band together. And people were still mad at Bush. But I feel like people were still kind of like patriotic and to an extent until we went to Iraq. <clears throat> yeah. I, uh, I mean, I remember that time. Well, I was in middle school, so I don't remember it that well, but like, I remember it just because, you know, it was such a controversy, that fucking election, Florida, you know, the ballots in Florida, the yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. 2000 election. And it was on the news every day for like mm-hmm. six months till I figured it out. And it was like, I, you know, I remember being in middle school, being like, man, this is really, really controversial. I, I think social media made the difference, right? Like it is yeah. because in that time of the Bush, the Bush Gore era, you still were relying on these major magazines and writers at those major magazines and editors at those major magazines and papers to distill the information for you so they could yeah. be reasonable, they could be grounded, they can provide evidence. And, and I guess it was just the beginning to be the hyperlink era where you can click on all the sources as you're reading the article. But, uh, you know, and now with social media, like I said, everybody gets to have their say. Everybody, whether you've been a vetted writer for, you know, 20 years with great editors in New York, or you've just been some random, you know, somebody's crazy uncle on yeah. Facebook gets to post whatever they want. They think, you know, Donald Trump is the second coming of Christ. Well, they get to fucking put that out there, you know, mm-hmm. on social media if they feel like it. Uh, and I think that made everything a little messier. So we, it was harder to see the forest from the trees because everybody was so worked up. Uh, and I think it was just, you know, a big shock to the system. Like this, this, I talk about it on one of those jerk, jerk shop episodes with a friend of mine where we were talking just like, there was a moment where everything all of a sudden became about Donald Trump. Like I remember the day after like that election, I remember sitting, I was an MFA at the time for, for this is the, the, you know, the Trump Clinton election 2016 yeah. now, but it's like, and I remember like staff, everybody being like, oh, do you need some time to yourself? Because, you know, the Republican won the election, you know, like, you know, one of the two major political parties in the United States won an election. Did you have, you need to do some time to yourself, like some, uh, some mer- you know, emotional support animal. And I'm just thinking like, what, like, what are we talking? Like, we're sitting in class right now after the day of an election and we're pretending like the world ended, you know? Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not, I know when I talk about this and when I say things like the DNC rubric of grading art, everybody. I know they're gonna come after me. Like, well, you're you you're some crazy Republican that's 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 that likes. <laughs> I mean, this is what happens, right? This yeah. is what happens. Like, I'm not an idiot. I know what people are gonna say, uh, and I always try to preempt it with. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> I'm mean, not. I'm just like I don't. I'm just calling it what I think, even handed. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, if that really is the case, right? Well, like, and you think of what's happening again. Like, if this happens again, you know. Are we going to repeat this? Are we going to repeat the last eight years? <laughs> if it actually good. happens again, like, what are we going to do? Are we going to run around with our hair on fire? Like, oh my yeah. God, we're all going to die. Or are we going to move forward? Like, kind of like. Well, it, it was weird because, like, in 2016, in the fall, I went on tour. I was on a, like, doing a solo acoustic tour across the country. But I'm living in fucking Hollywood at the time, right? And. I thought Hillary had it in the fucking bag because Same, all yeah. I saw was Hillary shit everywhere. I think and then, everybody did. Yeah. Yeah. And then I went on tour and it's, I think Las Vegas was the last place I saw a Hillary sign. And then the whole rest of the tour, like all I saw was Trump shit. Right. And yeah. I was like, Oh my God, like he could fucking win this thing, dude. Right. And I fucking got back like the day before voting started. And so I'm like, this is interesting. Like, I'm, and I was telling everyone, I'm like, hey guys, like, I don't know if you know this or not, but outside of here, I think people really like Trump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everyone's like, bullshit, bullshit, and everyone's getting ready to celebrate. And that's the right. whole thing. Whenever you start celebrating before the game's over, that's when like it hits you hard, dude. And I'm like, I don't know, dude. 
Like, so when it happened, I was shocked, but I remember everyone else left and I was sitting there by myself and I was just watching TV and I'm like, oh my fucking God, he pulled this off. I couldn't fucking believe it. But like at the same time, after going across the country and seeing like the Midwest and like middle America, you know, I was just like, oh fuck, dude. That 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 fucking shook me, dude. Like just seeing how yeah. different it is outside of LA. You yeah. know, for real. And I, I grew up, yeah, in like a liberal enclave. And it was, it was, you know, Maryland is say like 90 percent democrat most elections like you mm-hmm. know and then they have the dc kind of apparatus right in the state there they call it outside the beltway right when referring to outside dc but uh and i remember that because around that time 2015 2016 when i moved to louisiana for grad school so i was driving through parts of the country i'd never driven through before you know yeah. deep south and i remember seeing all these hand-painted like Trump's not like people loved him so much. They were hand making like signs mm-hmm. and putting them up on the sides of their houses so that the cars could see. And I was just like, you know, you didn't see that in Maryland, bro. <laughs> you were not seeing yeah. that where I was living. Totally. Uh, yeah. Like you were not seeing that. And I did too. Yeah. I thought it was in the bag. Yeah. For Hillary. I was like, I voted Hillary. I, uh, and I'm not ashamed to say that. I know there's some people that are like embarrassed to say that now or some, like, no, I'm not ashamed for anybody I voted for ever in my life. I've only been able to vote yeah. since 2008. No, I'm not ashamed for voting for anyone that I voted for, despite people trying to bully me out of it. You know, like kind of, you know, people are always doing that. They're like, yeah. you know, no. Which is why, and people have done that forever, which is why voting's secret. Right. <clears throat> why there's voting booths and shit and um, you go back to the corruption like when we were forming states out in the midwest right like the famous kind of st louis or uh kansas city incidents right where people were going back and forth over the line double yeah. voting and this is you know that was old old you know over 100 years ago and stuff i'm surprised that was... didn't come up like in the like oh, giuliani bring going. It up all the time yeah giuliani's like still, do you know yeah. that people went over the state line <laughs> 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 oh shit yeah, it and that's dude. If you speaking of Giuliani, two thousand and one Giuliani versus the Giuliani, oh did you ever think God. that this is what was going to happen? Like, dude, like seriously, yeah. his story could have ended at Borat, and right. I would have been like, wow, he really fucking took a digger. But now it's like, oh, Rico dude is getting fucking fucked on a Rico case. Are you fucking with me right now? Right. Like, oh, America's my mayor, God, dude. America's mayor. He was on the cover of Time magazine. Beloved. His approval rating skyrocketed. And yeah. now all of a sudden he's like this vampire like meme that people yeah. share. Around. Well, dude, because like, I can't remember. The mighty have fallen. What, <laughs> well, what year was it that he was running for president? Or he was oh, like running shit. for the nomination? He, I think he ran in 08 and I think he ran again. Oh, against Romney? I think he ran against Romney and he was just, you know, oh, wait, no. he, he threw his hat into the ring during... Yeah. Um, uh, the McCain and yeah, McCain was oh, like, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Romney was 12, 2012 right. for about yeah. the second term, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was I, shocked he's, that he, I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, he's gonna get it for sure, you know. He had a lot of goodwill <laughs> after the 9 11, yeah, yeah, he had a lot real. of good goodwill, but he clearly squandered all that. I don't know what he's doing now. Oh my fucking god, I think right now he's like trying to get his legal defense. Oh, that's right, right, because he's tied up in that too. Yeah, yeah, he has to turn himself in, like, right by Friday. Yeah, Jesus fucking Christ! I haven't been following that. I can't stomach a lot of like. I just you know, my eyes start glazing. It's like when I try to read philosophy or something. Mm -hmm. People, oh, read Nietzsche, read Nietzsche, and I start to read it, and I'm like, oh my god, don't (laughs) just like just read Schopenhauer (laughs) and like have a big fucking glass of something and just go, okay, the world is shit. Yeah, I probably have syphilis. Like, yeah, any of them, man. I'm just, I, I glaze over. I can't tolerate it. Like, I'm just, oh my god, I don't care what this person's <laughs> like. They're like theories on life. Yeah, they're boring the shit out of me. Because, like, uh, I, I was a philosophy major in college. Like, when I went to that small period of time, and I just wanted to fucking argue with people. You know, like, and a lot of it was, hey, let's read this and then talk about it. And I'm like, or you can just say, like, hey, this is the topic we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about it. You know, like, I'm like, you really want me to just fucking read this book 
and then fucking argue with you because I can tell you exactly what I think right now. Like <laughs> Jesus fucking <laughs> right. Christ. Right. Like yeah. let's cut out the middleman here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not not I'm, not, I'm, I'm the same way. Moment. I yeah. like I mean, I guess I'm a natural contrarian in some ways, and like I, I'm fine with that, but like, you know, Hitchens always talked about that in his letters to a young contrarian. Did you ever read that? Uh Mm-mm. His it's a short book and Hitchens has a great style where it reads very fast. So if you ever read his stuff, uh, it's 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 a good one to start with, listeners. But it's like he wrote about this where he said when he was a young guy, we'd get in trouble because he just liked to argue. Like he just liked yeah. to like, but let's have this out. You know, let's 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 actually talk about it, kind of thing. And this can get heated. And then as you get older, you learn to do it in a kind of respectful, kind of you know, the Oxford Union style way, where everybody gets the same time to speak, equal time to speak, and you have to you know, no insults, no yeah. you know do it in a, in a respectful kind of way. And I like that a lot. You know, I spend a lot of time on YouTube watching things like that. And, mm-hmm. and even conversations on a big Sam Harris guy and Sam Harris, you know, has great podcasts where he has purposely will go out of his way usually to find somebody that doesn't see eye to eye with him on something and just, you know, go into it for a couple hours fairly. He always says like on his podcast, he's like, look, if you say something you want cut out, tell me, I'll cut it out. He's like, I don't want my opponent to be misrepresented. I don't want them yeah. to be, you know, squeaked out with a little technicality. Like he's like, I'm not trying to do a gotcha. I literally want to understand. I want to, you know, you hear what I have to say and I want to hear what you have to say, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, it's, I think people are hungry for that. I think that's why you see all these kind of independent platforms like something like Sam Harris or, you know, anything else like that. There's, you know, hundreds, probably a million different things like that on YouTube and stuff, different channels that have various amounts of subscribers. But, you know, people are hungry for that. Like just like yeah. a civil kind of, hey, let's talk about it. You know, you disagree. I disagree. Let's sit down. Um, I, I think and I think you're right. Like it's starting to change. Like we're starting to see a shift back towards that kind of the what. I mean, I hate this term, but people use it all the time. The classically liberal, they would say, values of of what they think is are missing now. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, witch hunting, pointing fingers. I don't know. I feel like the problems that happen a lot more now are people having bad takes, bad social takes, bad political takes, or I think, and this is something that we're probably going to be talking about here in a second, but when a publisher doesn't vet the person that they're going to put out and they put out somebody who has ties to other magazines that like really push a certain ideology with the stuff they put out. Right. And so that like follows the poet to the next fucking like magazine or whatever and i think that's kind of what a lot of this shit is like i fucking railed on some fucking chick the problem i have when people do something fucking stupid like this is that they immediately decide oh i need to tell my side of the story i need to put a spin on this and so they'll go write an editorial somewhere and instead of defending anything they have done (laughs) They just go, look at what a victim I am. People are fucking mean. Like, I'm not going to say what I did because what I did is very fucking questionable. But guess what? I'm sad. And like, that's when I fucking lose my shit. It's just like, if you didn't do anything, say that you didn't do anything. But if you're not going to fucking say what the fucking thing was and defend your actions, then obviously you're hiding your actions. So pick and choose what the fuck you're going to do. But, like, that's the thing that drives me fucking crazy, dude. And that's tied up in this, too. I think, I think what you're, it's tied up in the guilt by association. Mm -hmm. So if you publish something, and you see this even with New York Times writers, a lot of times people will do this with, you know, I'm not a big fan of Nicole Hannah Jones, but I think she was unfairly treated in when people started digging up, you know, articles she wrote when she was in college, you know, like for college Mm -hmm. newspapers, when she was in college, trying to be a young reporter, kind of starting to get into that game. And now she works for the times, you know, 20 years later, or whatever it is, but like, people were digging stuff up from like 20 years ago, and be like, Oh, look at this kind of stuff. And what she wrote was kind of racist. Yeah, sure. But it was like, you know, that was 20 years ago, she was 20 years old, you know, like, she didn't know any better, you know, like, Mm -hmm. are we really going to punish people for this? Uh, but then, you know, if you're affiliated with the wrong, uh, political group, usually then yes, they will punish you for it. They will use it against you the rest of your life. It will be brought up 
every day, every interview, it will be brought up and paraded out and, uh, you know, whatever and, it is. And that's just politicking yeah. for work, yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah, know, exactly. like, yeah. and that's just one of those things, like, don't give them enough rope to fucking hang you with, you know what I'm saying? Like, cause like one of the reasons why I got out of the film business or whatever is because the fucking politicking that goes on to get fucking jobs right. is fucking like ridiculous. Like I've had people accuse me to producers and agents of some of the most like outrageous shit that I was like, God, if I really fucking did that, I'd be a fucking legend. Like, right. I, like they would ask me about it, like in my interview and I'm like, Oh my God. Like, that sounds fucking amazing. Like, I wish I was that fucking cool to pull shit like that off, you know? And I'm like, but I'm not. But, like, I don't know. Like, whatever. But, like, it's just, like, I can't. I can't fucking do that. Because, like, and I was just talking to a buddy of mine today who just, like, he wrapped a feature that's going to be coming out soon or whatever. And he had a lot of problems with the producers on it. And he's like, so I really want to just like go tell them like what's what and like have like a big like postmortem and shit. And I'm like, if you have a postmortem, all you need to do is go up and say, hey, you know, like I know I was really hard to work with. I was really passionate about the project, but I really just want you to know I appreciate the um, the opportunity you guys gave me to fucking make this movie for you. And I hope we can do it again. And then walk the fuck out of there because nobody. The, the sad truth is in Hollywood. Nobody cares what your talent level is as long as you are easy to work with and could get things done on time. Other right. than that, nobody gives a shit about your fucking artistic vision. And that's right. fucking sad. And it's 100% the exact way it fucking is. Right. That's why you have so many fucking lackluster motherfuckers making lackluster fucking movies. Because it just... It, like they're, they're probably the most likable fucking person on the planet. And that's why they have that fucking job. I've heard a lot of <clears throat> horror stories from that angle. Yeah. From the Hollywood studio systems and stuff where, uh, yeah. I mean, what can you do? Right. Like there, it, like this is a business. This is corporate art. Like this yeah. is corporate art. So you're going to have to give a little, but I've heard, you know, Hollywood respects a big dick, dude. Or even if you don't have one, you just act like you do. They just like respect it for some reason. Like, you know, Jerry Seinfeld always says this to like young comedians where they're mm -hmm. like worried. They're like, you know, I don't want to be an asshole. And he just looks at him. He's like, being hard to work with does not stop you from working in Hollywood. <laughs> okay. He's like, what stops you from working in Hollywood is it sucked. Nobody yeah. liked it. It lost money. <laughs> he's yeah. like, that's what stops you from working. All right. If you're, if you just like, a tyrant on set like doesn't matter as long as the See, product sells like here's <laughs> you know there, there's of, two uh, things about that and i guess level One, of fame matters right like, well yeah. level of fame matters definitely but like yeah. if you're coming in and you want to have a big swing and dick and we're like using that terminology here now right right, right. the thing is big swinging dick let's yeah <laughs> if <laughs> <laughs> if you are someone who's on set and you're an actor and you have a big swing and dick, right. that's fine. That's expected of you because it's the production's job to rein you in. But if you are a fucking director who's like kind of new coming up and you're trying to have a big swing and dick, like that's not the fucking place for it. Your big swing and dick is supposed to happen in the interviews afterwards. You right. know, like, your job is to make sure that this movie gets made and is not costing more money than it's right. than it was originally supposed to. But the talent on set, like the actors and shit, yeah, they they could have the biggest fucking egos and walk around like whatever all they fucking want, and that could help them and it could not. But, um, but yeah, like that's just it's expected. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, I have no experience with it, so I'm just talking out of my ass anyway. You know? No, I mean, but, it's, a, yeah. it's a good point, yeah. like, because there there is something to be said. Okay, like, and I'm going to go back to a wrestling analogy now. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Vince McMahon, owner of the WWE. If you left WWE, Vince would be pissed. Right. But because you left he would love to have you come back. 
right and try to make some money out of that if you left and talked mad shit on the company he would want you back even more because then when you came back it was like see he talked all this shit but now he's back and there were a lot of people who left the company and didn't talk shit because they respected the company and vince never asked those people to come back It's it's just this fucking weird fucking dichotomy of fucking people who want to see whose dick's the biggest, dude. I think it's an interesting point you bring too. Like if somebody likes you, they're more likely to forgive you, right? Like if you're just like a likable person or you're friends with somebody, mm-hmm. like they're more likely to forgive bad behavior in certain yeah. instances, depending on what it is, right? Like, you know, we're not excusing away terrible shit, but it's like yeah, I think there's something to that. Like if you're well liked and a lot of times in this types of businesses like Hollywood, you know, a lot of it is just like, yeah, I kind of like that guy. Give him a call next time I'm making a project. You know, hey, I yeah. got a role for you. Or hey, you know, I need you to rewrite, you know, whatever it is. Like yeah. you just it's all about networking and like not even networking, but just like they have to like you too, right? Do you yeah. belong outside of work kind mm-hmm. of thing? No, like the you reason know? why I got as many jobs as I did is because like one of my like like internal goals was I'm not just going to make this movie on budget. I'm going to come in under budget. Like, and that's just how it's going to be. And I'm going to be like super fucking like glad hand and motherfucker while I do it, you know, and I'll still have my like artistic whatevers, but like, I'm going to come in under budget because like the thing that talks more than anything is fucking money. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. So that was fine. But then when I started feeling like I was being taken advantage of, I wanted to have these postmortems. I wanted to be the one that was like, look at all I'm doing for you, you piece of shit, motherfucker. (laughs) And like get into like physical shit with people. And I never got calls back from those producers. Right. Like, even though I did a bunch of work for them in the past and made them fucking money. Like at this point, like me fucking being difficult was like oh we're just not gonna work with him anymore right it's just like like as long as you don't have a loud opinion like you could get a lot of work in this fucking world dude but nobody fucking wants opinions producers think they're like top shit you know and i mean we've kind of gone off topic here and that is where we're gonna cut it today um that was me just having a good pre-chat with andrew before we get into the heavy shit which will be coming in future episodes okay next episode will be episode 100 it is the big q a episode and um that'll be loads of fun okay so again pharma phoenix rises is out now um poems about fucking coming at the end of the week 13 miles south of hell will be out next week poems over pussy out now on my etsy shop as well as all the chat books that are still in print and then you could also pick up bloodshed review and the blood rag over there as well make sure you join the anarchy crew if you haven't yet hit the join button below this video on youtube and if you're just listening to this on itunes share it with a friend and give this a five star review because you know you want to and you know you're not a piece of shit Okay, so let's just make this right, okay? So, with all of that, type art, everybody, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon, I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.